Okay, good morning. Let's come to order. We're going to talk about the uh, politics today. This is probably my favorite book of the ones that we will be reading. And I'll tell you something interesting, which is when I first read this book, are you having problems with the door? <laughs> really? Okay, if it doesn't close, it doesn't close. It's fine. Don't worry about it. The whole world can hear about Aristotle. Um, it's interesting that when I first read this book, and I was about your age, I was probably 18 or 19 when I first read it, I did not like this book at all. And I thought, oh, this Aristotle fellow, I have no time for him. And then when I reread it, was I had to teach it. And so instead of reading it as a student, that it was sort of like a, for, a reading that was forced upon me, I read it as a, as a, as a work that, was, that I was going to teach. I came to have an entirely different appreciation of it. If I do my job right, I hope at least to convey it in part why I think it's such an interesting book. To me, what struck me when I reread it was how relevant, how insightful this book is. And so despite the fact that it was written, what, 24 centuries ago, there's a remarkable amount of stuff in this book that I think is still worth our attention. And indeed, the very sort of foundational idea of the politics is still, I think, operative in terms of how we think of ourselves. So what we want to do today is we want to go through the first part of the book. I've assigned, as the reading, a lot of the book. I've assigned books one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight, I think, or something like that. Anyway, obviously, I don't expect everyone to read every page of every reading that we do. And I know that for those of you who have chosen not to write an essay topic on Aristotle, you may not have given this text uh, the same amount of time as you did the Republic. But if you have the opportunity, I do urge you to take a look at the text because it's, it's a very, very interesting text. So uh, if you haven't yet looked at it, it's certainly worth your attention. What I want to do then is I want to go through book one. Today I want to go through book one and book two and sort of explore some of the key ideas that we find in, in Aristotle. Let's take a look at, the, at the, what the politics is. So it's worth noting that Aristotle, although we think of him as a philosopher, was really what we might call a polymath. Over the course of his lifetime, he engaged in an extraordinary array of inquiry. And although we think of him as sort of the author of the ethics and stuff like that, a lot of his work was actually uh, in the field of what today we would consider to be the natural sciences. So things like zoology, botany, as well as uh, physics and mathematics. So he was really a wide ranging, a wide ranging thinker. And the politics then is simply a part of this much larger, much larger corpus. That matters in some ways because one of the things we find in the politics is that Aristotle's bringing a kind of methodology that's informed by, a part by this sort of inquiry into other things. So um, just as Aristotle's thinking about the politics, so too Aristotle liked to do things like dissect animals to see what they were made of, right? And we see there's a kind of similar methodology between the kinds of practices you would bring to inquiry in the botanical or natural <laughs> sciences and the kind of inquiry you bring into the, into the politics. And the thing about the, the politics is that, uh, as you may know, Aristotle was a teacher, right? He, he went to Plato's symposium and just stayed there his entire life, and then he set up his own academy. And so the, the texts that we have, and this includes the politics, are often the texts that he was, they're basically his lecture notes. This is what he used to teach his students. So unlike the Republic, which is this kind of lengthy disquisition about the nature of justice and so on and so forth, the politics actually is a kind of a classroom text, the purpose of which was to sort of allow Aristotle, the teacher, to talk to his students about what politics, what politics means. And indeed, one of the reasons that it's, uh, it reads some, in, some of the, in the way that it does is, as he tells us in the text at some point, he says that it's not a polished work, right? It, re it sort of reads like the notes that you might put down on paper to then uh, talk about it further length. And the reason that matters is because, as we'll see in this, particularly in this first book, there's some really quite extraordinary ideas which he dispatches in just a couple of sentences, core foundational concepts that you think would you know, merit an entire chapter in and of themselves, but he does, he just sort of puts it out there and he kind of lets it go. And if the reason for that is because as it was an aid to actually his lectures, he would then talk about it at much greater length in the classroom. So what I want to do is I want to look at the first part of the politics, right? The politics in eight books, but each book deals with some different, the uh, different subject matter. I want to look at book one, and I want to look at book two. And in book one, what he does is he lays out, if you will, an agenda for why, why we should study politics and how we should think about politics. And then in book two, and this is uh, relevant given where we're just coming from in this class, he immediately turns his attention to the pre-existing 
uh, work on politics that informed ancient Greek culture, namely the work that his teacher Plato had written, The Republic, and he engages in this criticism of the Republic. And so what we want to do is then go through those two today and see what he, see what he says. Let's look at the beginning of book one. Let's look at the very first thing that he, uh, that he says. Every state is a community of some kind, and every community is established with a view to some good. For everyone always acts in order to obtain that which they think good. But if all communities aim at some good, the state or political community, which is the highest of all and which embraces all the rest, aims at good in a greater degree than any other and at the highest good. We might pause here for a moment to look at the words that he uses. So the idea that the state is established with a view to some good, he uses the Greek word agathos, meaning just a, a good, isn't like a, a, a good thing. But then we have the idea that the state is constituted, so the state which is the highest of all communities, is constituted to achieve the highest good. And when we look at this notion of good with the highest good, they're actually separate concepts. Against the concept of agathos, the idea of good, the highest good is a different thing. And we've seen it already in this class because the highest good refers back to this idea of eudaimonia that we saw in the Republic. What was eudaimonia? Remember? Good spirits, or we would say flourishing. This is typically how it's translated as human flourishing. The capacity for the individual to realize all the things that she can realize. To be in an environment where you have that sense of being able to achieve the things that you can achieve. So it's not just the sense of good, it's the sense of um, a sort of more encompassing, uh, more encompassing good. Entire articles, I should note, have been written about the concept of eudaimonia. And in the Nicomachean Ethics, if you're interested, he explores this concept of eudaimonia, the idea of human flourishing in much greater length. But the point about the state then is, if the state is constructed to achieve good agathos, the point then is ultimately to achieve this highest level of good, which is a kind of transcendental good, namely the idea of eudaimonia. Why does that matter? That matters because what it suggests is that the individual cannot realize her potential. She cannot be the person she is supposed to be unless she is in what? A well-constituted state. So that the, the nature of politics matters with respect to the individual because then the capacity or the potential of the individual is linked back then to the political life or the political environment in which the individual finds herself. I have a quote here from Thomas Nagel about what eudaimonia means in this context. He says, eudaimonia involves not just the activity of the theoretical intellect, but the full range of human life and action in accordance with the broader excellences of moral virtue and practical wisdom. It entails all those elements that shape and guide your actions and your thinking and your behaviors. And if you think about it, the political environment in which you find yourself is going to have a very important role with respect to the capacity for, as Nagel puts it, to practice the full range of human life in accordance with the excellences of moral virtue and practical wisdom. So all this to say, at the very beginning, that very first sentence explains why we should talk about politics. Politics is not some abstract game of power. Politics matters to the kind of lives that people lead. And if you care, therefore, about the kind of life you lead, you need to care about politics. This, in fact, is the theme of the first part of book one because he then further explains why it is that we, human beings, need to think about this question of, of politics. And the answer, as he says, and you probably know the famous phrase, he says that we are a zoon politicon. We are political animals. That's perhaps the most, one of the most famous phrases that we have from Aristotle, that we are a zoon politicon. What is it that makes us a political animal? Why does Aristotle declare that we are political animals? Those of you who have read the text, you will recall that he, dis he says that we are distinguished from other animals by virtue of a specific or singular ability. And it actually refers back to what we sometimes call Aristotelian essentialism, which is what, make what is the essence of something? What is it that makes something what it is? So in this case, we are a political animal by virtue of our essence. We can easily explain this idea of essentialism because if you think about it, you could define a human being as an animal, right, that lives and breathes and has two eyes, a nose, and two ears, and hair. Would you be capturing the essence of a human being if you provided a description like that? No, because that could also apply to your cat. So therefore, it doesn't capture the essence of the human being, right? Those are incidental features to who we are. 
What is it that makes us what we are? What is the essence of man? And for Aristotle, the essence of us is what the Greeks call logos. Logos, does anybody know what this word means? It means two things. It means at a basic level, logic, yes, but at a basic level it also means speech or word. So a logos is a word or speech. So he says that we are distinguished from all other animals by our capacity for speech. He notes that there are other animals which are, which are social. And again, because Aristotle had engaged in this inquiry into the natural world, for instance, he was aware that bees display certain social characteristics. So it is not our essence that we are social. Our essence is that we have this capacity for speech, this idea of, of logos. This is the unique characteristic of man, that we, have, that we have logos. The fact that the Greeks use the word logos both for speech and for reason is actually quite interesting because it's not just therefore the capacity to make a sound or even a shaped sound, it's the capacity for the sounds that we make to be shaped or guided by or defined by reason. And the point about it is that the, the fact that we have speech, this is for Aristotle what makes us political animals. As he says in the text, we are not self-sufficient. He says that we must find ourselves inside of a community. And it's, if you think about it, it follows from the idea of this capacity for logos, this capacity for speech. Because if you have the capacity to speak, what are you going to need? Someone to listen. To speak and to listen are essentially flip sides of the same thing. This thing that makes us who we are implies, as a function of our very essence, that we must be involved in a relationship. It's part of who we are. That in, order to, in order for us to exercise our capacity for speech, we must be in a community so that other, someone else around us is there to, to listen. We are inherently a social animal. And in a kind of quasi-evolutionary reading of man, Aristotle points out that unlike some other animals, we are not self-sufficient. In order for us to live good lives, we rely upon others. We, were, we need to be in communities. As he says in the text, those, a man who is not in a community is either a beast or a god, is outside of politics, is either a beast or a god. And since I assume none of us want to be beasts, we'd all like to be gods, but actually since that's not an, optional, an option either, that means that we are going to live our lives as political animals. And if we're political animals, it means that we need to think about the politics that we practice. This is important because it relocates politics from where most of us ordinarily would locate it, which would be in a kind of power structure, in you know, law giving and this kind of thing. If we are political animals, if the politics that we practice is shaped by or defined by our capacity for logos, if logos is actualized as soon as you are in a relationship with someone else, someone speaking, someone listening, where does politics happen at its most basic level? And it happens simply in the relationships you have with other people. As soon as you meet someone and you start talking to them, for Aristotle, that is a political relationship. The relationship you have with other people is defined by a certain kind of politics, how you work out the ways in which you interact or engage with other people. That's, for Aristotle, a political uh, element. And so, from the very beginning, then, we have this sense that politics matters to us because it will define the lives that we are allowed or capable of leading, and it informs then the, f the most fundamental unit that defines our existence, namely the relationships that we have with other people. For, for Aristotle, all of that is then encapsulated by, uh, by this idea of, of politics. And so unlike the Republic, which was a kind of a thought experiment in which a political system was crafted to investigate the question of justice as a virtue of the soul or as an excellence of the soul. For Aristotle, politics is a much more compelling question in and of itself because if the politics that we have around us is going to shape the kinds of lives that we can lead, it means we need to think about how to practice that politics. So politics for Aristotle is not a science, pace political science departments, Aristotle would not agree. It's not a science, it's not something that can be discovered in an existing state and described in the way you might, say, describe a mineral or a, a planet or something. It's an art. It's like the piano. It's something that you can do, and you can do it well or you can do it badly. How do you learn how to do something well? What do you need to do? Practice, Practice and study it. You need to acquire knowledge about what it is. 
And so it's not simply an artifact that's there for somebody to, to describe and it's immutable. Instead, it's an art. It's an art that we need to acquire knowledge about and we therefore need to practice. And this is therefore means that politics is, is a practical science. It's a practical thing, something that we need to, to think about so that we can do it well. And you'll see that, in fact, interestingly, suffused through the text, but particularly in book two, he provides us with a lot of real world examples of, of things that people do by way of demonstrating the kind of practical side of the politics that we can practice for ourselves. Politics is not who gets to rule, who gets to make the laws, and so on. Politics <coughs> defines the relationships you have at the most organic level. And so therefore, because politics suffuses our life and defines the kind of life that we can have, it is therefore incumbent upon us, it is important for us, to learn how to practice the best kind of politics that we can. So insofar as the eudaimonia of an individual life links back to our capacity to realize our own self as political creatures, therefore it's, it's a personal project. We are, all of us in this room, politicians. Every day, all of us practice politics because we all of us have social relationships, we all speak with other people. Therefore, since we're all politicians, we must all learn the politics. It's a universal, a universal discipline in this sense. I will also say that in distinction with, with Plato, we saw that in the Platonic scheme, Plato's primary preoccupation, we didn't get into this particularly in our discussion of the Republic, but for those of you who know Platonic philosophy and his theory of forms, the idea is that for Plato, perfection lies in a transcendental plane. And what we're happening here, those of you know the, the analogy of the cave, the idea there is that physical existence reflects a kind of transcendental <coughs> perfection. So it's a, it's a metaphysics of transcendence, right, in, in Plato. Aristotle, on the other hand, is a pretty aggressive empiricist. What matters is what you can see, how you can describe it, and the like. Whereas for Plato, politics can be understood as reflecting then this kind of larger transcendental truth. For Aristotle, politics is an empirical question. What do people do? How do they behave? How do they act? What are the things that we can implement? It's grounded in the practical arts. These are, these are not sort of transcendental questions. These are the kinds of questions that we need to think about at a practical level. And indeed, you'll see as you go through the text that there are a lot of features of the text that reflect that kind of highly practical engagement. My favorite, perhaps, of all, I'll tease it down, we'll come back to it uh, in another class, but my favorite is his discussion of the practice of what's called the communal meal. In ancient Greek society, there was a tradition where the, the citizens of the city would all have a meal together. For Aristotle, the way in which you define that communal meal matters a great deal. Different cities did it in different ways. That sounds to us pretty remote and abstract, but as we'll see, it's that kind of attention to detail that I think makes Aristotle still astonishingly relevant. So there is a lot of distinction from, from Plato, but I think in this initial, initial discussion, the whole idea is he's relocating politics into the level of the individual himself, right? This is something that we can all do. We might note this idea of logos and politics then, in terms of how we practice it, how politics shapes us, with reference to another Aristotelian work, because it gives us some insights about how Aristotle wants us to think about political life. You have probably encountered the, the sort of three musketeers of Aristotelian system, pathos, ethos, and logos. Have you heard of that before? Yes. This is from the rhetoric. What's the purpose of ethos, pathos, and logos? To help you persuade somebody or to convince somebody? That's exactly right. This is Aristotle's idea. It comes from the, the rhetoric. So what is rhetoric? Rhetoric is how you shape your argument, how you shape your, your a presentation. And the purpose of an argument is to persuade. So the idea is you stand on three things, and they're self-interlocking, essentially. One is ethos, right? That's the character of the speaker. One is pathos. That's the empathy of the speaker. And then one is logos. That is the reasonableness of the speaker. And so as a function of your character, your empathy, and your reasonableness, the idea is to craft an argument that is capable of persuasion. So the point of logos, then, is not just that it is speech, not just that it is reasonable speech, but that it is persuasive speech. Politics, then, can be redefined as this power of persuasion in the context of trying to work out various rules. As he says in the text, 
to consider questions of what is just and what is unjust, what is expedient and what is inexpedient. Where there is a moment of discussion or, dis or dispute or tension between people, we can use our logos, we can use our capacity for persuasive and reasonable speech to come to some kind of an agreement. And if you can persuade someone of your point of view and then it produces some kind of an action, that is a political skill. That is a, that is a political action that you've essentially engaged in. So, the idea of logos then links to this sort of environment of persuasion, right? And so politics then builds on this question of, um, of persuasion. So he says that man then is a political animal. Our nature is political, characterized then as a result of this question of logos. And that means that for a human being, unless he is a beast or a god, that part of our ability to realize who we are then requires that we, that we think about politics and learn how to practice it in the best way that we, that we can. So in a sense, that's the purpose of this book. 